Hello guys, uh, welcome to today's screencast. Uh, the focus is going to be on um, aerobic adaptations. Now if you have a look through so far aerobic pathway, we've had a look at um, obviously our slow oxidative type 1 muscle fibres, uh, we've looked at the structure and functional characteristics within those, we've also had a look at the aerobic energy system and how that provides energy or resynthesizes ATP, lots of it, 38 to be exact, um, during low intensity, high duration work, such as a marathon runner. Uh, on top of that, we then had a look at aerobic capacity. Now within aerobic capacity, we've looked at the definitions of aerobic capacity VO2 max. Then we've gone on to have a look at the factors that affect aerobic capacity or VO2 max, sorry. We've also had a look at methods of measuring or evaluating them. So we looked at multi-stage fitness test, uh, Cooper's run, 12 minutes Cooper's run, gas analysis, uh, the Queen's step test then we had a look at training types and I suppose that's the key thing really because if we look at training types right now we're thinking of high intensity interval training or um, continuous training as two methods by which a marathon runner for example could improve their fitness by applying the fit principle if they do that if they train using the fit principle to, imp to improve their vo2 max and aerobic capacity what are the adaptations they will get. So our focus, it isn't actually on this bit here, but we're going to have a look at the adaptations based around aerobic training. How does our body, in particular our muscular, metabolic, cardiovascular and respiratory systems, how do they change and adapt if we subject them to aerobic training okay so that's what we're going to have a look at now if you have a look in so our title of the kind of focus within the lesson is going to be ad adaptations to aerobic training so what i'd ask you to do now is a couple of things just to consider so first one as i've kind of mentioned there in the screencast when you're talking about aerobic adaptations you don't have to copy this down at the moment if you're talking about aerobic adaptations we have to be able to be prepared to in the exam categorize these adaptations into these systems metabolic you need know, a breakdown of kind of fuels um muscular um so we're, we're pretty good on this i think our muscle fibers for example uh what's in our muscles then cardiovascular obviously anything to do with the heart and the vascular system and then finally our respiratory kind of system on top of that so you will remember certain things when we start to look at these adaptations you'll remember studying the cardiovascular system you'll remember studying the respiratory system you'll remember words coming from within the metabolic system and the muscular system and that is why this is a really nice way to sum up um you know our kind of aerobic pathway so if we have a look then let's have a and there's something else we'll maybe have a look at in lesson is, is the ability to evaluate these adaptations. So that's something we'll have a look on top of that. And if I just give you an example of a type of question that will come up, uh, or did come up most recently in the 2019 AS exam, it was this. And it asked, after talking about aerobic capacity, it asked um, for team gauge in this case, it asked it to evaluate the benefits, as you can see there, the ad physiological adaptations, the changes within our body made by the muscular and metabolic systems after a period of aerobic training. So as you can see, they could ask you to categorize. Okay, so that's important. And that'll be the heading of each of the slides as we go through. So let's have a look then. Muscular adaptations to aerobic training. So within our muscle cells, we have certain things that change as a result of kind of hit training, continuous training. The first one is we have an increase in mitochondrial density or size. So if you remember from the aerobic energy system, um, we use the mitochondria matrix here in this bit here. And we also had a look at the mitochondria cristae. So remember the mitochondria matrix was used for the Krebs cycle. And that's where we synthesized the 2 ATP there. And then also we had the kind of mitochondria cristae on the folds of the mitochondria, which Nad and Fad took um, kind of hydrogen down to allow us to resynthesize 34 ATP. So if we think now, if you take part in aerobic training, hit training, continuous training, what is happening is we increase the size of our mitochondria okay and on top of that it becomes more dense which means we can increase the ability of our aerobic system to metabolize fuels you know such as glycogen and glucose uh, fats so it allows us to break down these fuels and create energy more efficiently which is obviously a really really big advantage because we know the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the muscle cell it's the the place where the kind of, I suppose, uh, a, the resynthesis of ATP takes place. It's really important for us to keep that in our head. The second muscular one is linked to myoglobin stores. Now, you might remember myoglobin, we talked about it in gaseous exchange. We talked about it uh, um, when you, uh, during exercise, we talked about the idea of exchanging gases into the muscle cell from the blood. Now, if you remember here, well, I'll just go through the adaptation and take you over to the picture in a second. If we exercise, we increase 
the number of myoglobin stores, okay, which means we can increase oxygen transport to working muscles. Now, if you have a look here, you've got hemoglobin here, or red blood cells, whichever way you want to look at it. So within the hemoglobin here, we have oxygen, and it's transported then into myoglobin into our muscle cells. So if we imagine here, what we're getting is we're getting an increased store of myoglobin in the muscle, which means we can then transfer oxygen or diffuse oxygen into the working muscles and allow us to perform aerobically for longer. So ultimately, two things, one increase in size, would increase in, the, in stores, mitochondrial density size, increased myoglobin stores. Both of these allow us to perform aerobically um, for longer, okay, before we reach fatigue. Now, if we go on from here, final one, there is also a hypertrophy of slow oxidative type 1 fibers, okay? And of course, if we can get uh, an increase in size of the muscle fibers that allow us to respire aerobically, that means we can increase aerobic energy production. So that's our key focus there. So hopefully you feel like you could have a decent go at those. Mitochondrial density, myoglobin, and then hypertrophy of oxidative type 1 fibers or slow oxidative type 1 fibers. Right, let's go on the next one. So metabolic adaptation then. So metabolic particularly focused on this idea of metabolizing fuels uh, within our aerobic system in order to allow us to produce or we synthesize ATP or to produce energy in this section. So what we have then, if we take part in aerobic exercise, we increase aerobic enzyme activity. So enzymes such as lipase for fats, GPP, PFK, uh, GPP for glycogen, PFK for glucose, these enzymes become more active, okay, which means that if we have more active aerobic enzymes, it means we can break down more fuel, okay, so more aerobic fuels such as fats and glycogen. Now, the second uh, adaptation linked to this, if we get more enzymes that are active, e.g. They can, they can break down the fuels to create ATP, then we also have an increase in the stores of the fuels for, for example, fat and glycogen. So we increase naturally the amount of fat stored and glycogen, which means we can break it down more. But without an increase in aerobic enzyme activity, we can't break down the fuels to resynthesize ATP. So you see how these two work as a pair, really. Okay, it's all very well having more enzymes, but if you haven't got more fuel to break down, they don't really work. So if you take part in aerobic exercise, not only do you increase the fat and glycogen stores within your muscles or within our bodies to allow us to break it down, but we also increase the enzymes available to break them down, which is fantastic. So that allows us to perform aerobically for longer. And actually, you know, we'll look at the net effect when you come into the lesson, but every single thing here delays the point of obla. Okay, so next one, our category is looking at cardiovascular adaptation. This is looking at anything to do with the heart, the heart muscle, or the vascular system, e.g. the vessels and the blood. So what happens, I'm sure some of this will come back to you from GCSE, if we subject the body to aerobic uh, training, such as HIIT training, continuous training, what happens is we have something called cardiac hypertrophy, which is an increase in the size of the heart muscle. Now, if we do that, what happens is, as a result, because our heart's bigger, it increases the pumping capacity. And what this means is it increases our stroke volume, cardiac output, venous return, and then it, as a result of it, it decreases rest in heart rate because it doesn't need to pump as many times to get the blood out from the body per beat, stroke volume, and per minute cardiac output. So if you can see that, by getting a bigger heart size, which we have to call cardiac hypertrophy, this means we can pump out more blood per beat, e.g. stroke volume, we can eject more blood per uh, minute cardiac output, and we can get more blood back to the heart after exercising. So that's a key thing to make sure we've got there. These are the effects. This is the impact if we go on from there then. Next one, increased efficiency of vascular shunt. So when we're trying to redistribute blood to the working muscles, if we don't train, we still do it, but if we do aerobic training, we increase the efficiency of it because we increase the elasticity of the arterioles, okay, which are those kind of vessels that allow us to push the blood towards the working muscles and away from the heart. So this means that we get more oxygenated blood to the working muscles. Now, on top of that, we increase red blood cell production or hemoglobin content. What this means is red blood cells are oxygen carriers within our blood. So if we do that, it means we can increase the oxygen transport into the working muscles. We've already had a look at myoglobin within the muscles. On top of that, we have capillarization. So capillarization then, capillaries are kind of within our blood and allow gases exchange to take place. Now we have them anyway, but if we take part in aerobic exercise, such as hit and continuous, what this means is we increase the density of capillaries around the alveoli. So as we know, 
oxygen is transferred from the alveoli into the blood. The blood consists of capillaries, and that allows uh, oxygen to be carried then towards the working muscles. So if we can get more capillaries around, or more dense formation of capillaries around the working muscles and the alveoli, that means that we can increase our efficiency of gaseous exchange, which means we can get more oxygen where we need it, and more carbon dioxide where we don't need it. Okay, away from where we don't need it, sorry. So if we go from there, last couple, and uh, this is the respiratory adaptation. So within our respiratory system, if we do aerobic training, things change to our respiratory system. So let's have a look at those two things that change on here then. So firstly, we have an increased surface area of the alveoli. Okay, so if I have an increased surface area of the alveoli, remember that is our first site for gaseous exchange. What that means is we have an increased site for gaseous exchange, which we can get more oxygen into our blood capillaries and then take them through to the muscles. On top of that, we also have an increased efficiency of the mechanics of breathing. Now, you remember from the mechanics of breathing, we had uh, the, the kind of diaphragm, the external intercostal muscles, the ribs, thoracic cavity volume, thoracic cavity pressure. Now, you can't change physically the ribs, but what you can do is change the muscles uh, attached either to or below the ribs, for example, the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles. So what we have then, increased efficiency of mechanics of breathing due to, you could say, respiratory muscle hypertrophy, an increase in respiratory muscle size. And these specific examples of these are the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles. And what that means is that you get more air in, deeper, and more air out at a faster rate. And these terms, as we know, are called tidal volume and minute ventilation. So these will be the things that change with regard to our uh, respiratory system. So I could just say this now, if you want to make a note of this at the end of um, your notes, it's basically as a result of taking part in aerobic activity. The net effect of all of this is there is an increase in VO2 max, one. The second thing that happens is there is a delay in the point of obla. Okay, so the point of onset of blood lactate accumulation, the, the point where lactate accumulation exceeds the speed at which we can remove it is moved back. So we can run for longer before we feel that lactate taking over. Okay, on top of that, increases our intensity and duration of exercise so we can work it more intensely and for a longer period. And finally, it helps prevent fatigue. So I'd really appreciate it if you could just make a note of those, pause and rewind if you need to, and they are the net effects of these adaptations. Okay, thanks very much.